you know, I don't think it is adequately appreciated by the industry or by the markets or by providers of capital how severe the cliff we're heading towards is with respect to these critical minerals going into the energy transition. From the research base, we see lots of uh, people looking at the materials challenges and saying, well, if we couldn't use lithium, what are the alternatives? I see that as something that we can do here in the UK. We're incredibly good at innovation using technology. Um, and I think we should steer away from offsetting where we can and focus on the actual problem at hand and actually innovate carbon out of our supply chains within the battery supply chain in the UK. Where do I think we will get to through the funds that we've got available and um, through the policy instruments of the Auto to Transformation Fund? I think, um, I think with what we've got on the books at the moment, I think we can get very close to 80 or 90 gigawatt hours of invested capacity commitment within the next 12 or 18 months uh, to be built out in that period between now and 2030. There's a lot of transferable skills and we do see that. What we do need is that central piece, right? And the Faraday Battery Challenge and APC uh, and partners like that, we work together. Hello and welcome to viewers tuning in live and to those catching up on the recording of this session. We're putting the UK's decarbonisation ambitions in the spotlight today. So introducing my stellar panel of business leaders and investors in the sector, we're delighted to have involved Jackie Murray, Deputy Director of the Faraday Battery Institute, Kate Renane, Investment Director at Longwall Venture Partners, Ryan Manell, CEO of TechMet, Richard Taylor, Founding Partner of Green Lithium, and Julian Hetherington, Director of Automotive Transformation at the Advanced Propulsion Centre. So a warm welcome to everyone and thanks very much for giving your time here. This webinar is intended to focus on the UK ambitions across decarbonisation, primarily with the transport sector. Um, there's no denying, however, the intensity of the global backdrop at present. We all obviously wish for the invasion and the war in Ukraine to come to an end, but it creates a very interesting context with regards to sanctions on Russia, on top of an already hot commodity market that have created sensational prices in metals, uh, price rises in oil and gas as well. This, of course, impacts everyone's decarbonisation plans and the value chains around battery materials. So I wanted to start just by framing the discussion and ask uh, around what are the perceived impacts of these sanctions and, uh, and the conflict? Is it fanning a fire that was already very difficult for raw materials supply? And Brian, I think as you're invested right across the value chain and chiefly in, in, in the metals business, could I start with yourself? Well, well, thanks very much, Adam. Clearly, the tragic situation in Ukraine has further focused attention on supply chain vulnerability in the energy transition. And this is something that has been radically accelerated by the COVID crisis over the last two years, um, but that much more so now, um, particularly in light of the growing access between China and Russia, which is likely to be a... Um, ongoing outcome of the present situation, however it plays out in the coming weeks. And obviously, um, you know, we all hope that somehow it stabilizes and loss of life um, slows. Um, so it's, it's, it's um, and this is in the eyes of the Americans, the Europeans, obviously here in the UK and the Japanese, it's become more and more obvious and more and more pressing as a contributor to the growing realization of the supply demand dislocation and massive security of supply of battery metal cliff that we're heading towards. And, you know, I think, you know, to step away for a second from the present geopolitical context, which is obviously very immediate and pressing, you know, I don't think it is adequately appreciated by the industry or by the markets or by providers of capital how severe the cliff we're heading towards is with respect to these critical minerals going into the energy transition and the EV ecosystem in particular. And I know that I'm preaching to the converted with, you know, on this call, but we do have to all do a lot more to highlight the severity of the structural short supply that is very, very pertinent to the UK context, but equally so in the US and Japan and everywhere that hasn't done what China has done enormously successfully and have a 15 year program of securing control of the supply chain so that they have a radical advantage one year, two years, five years, 10 years out 
as the supply demand dislocation becomes more and more severe. I mean, it's lovely BW spending $60 billion or whatever they're spending on electrification of their fleet and likewise GM and Ford and Tesla and everybody else. But we're heading towards an almost inescapable inevitability that five years out, this massively increased lithium-ion battery manufacturing capacity and, and EV manufacturing capacity will be sitting half idle. They simply will not be able to secure adequate supply of the inputs to use the capacity that they're presently spending tens and tens of billions of dollars on, and they have the market for the products that this capacity is, is, is being invested. There's equally as severe um, um, outlook from a point of view of ensuring we have a supply chain to feed a EV industry in the UK, without which there's going to be no auto industry in the UK in five years. So, I mean, I know this is, you know, I'm just jumping ahead from, from the Ukraine, but I mean, this has just added enormously to the focus of attention on this, this crisis and this cliff we're heading towards. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, decarbonization itself is a global challenge and the supply chains are embedded all over the world. Um, yeah, we're talking specifically about the UK here, so important to have it in context. Thanks, Brian. Um, Richard, could I bring you in as someone who's looking at sort of the refining capacity within the UK? But of course, you know, you, you, you have to have upstream partners. Um, you have to have a raw material supply coming in. Um, just with what Brian's touched on there, do you have any other points to add? Yes, thank you very much, Adam. And uh, thank you all uh, for taking the time for this call. Should be a really interesting one, especially given what's happening uh, out in the Ukraine. I think the points uh, that I'm seeing now uh, filter out of it is just that magnifying glass is really, as Brian said, focusing on the importance of localised supply chains. And uh, here in the UK, you know, we need to establish those supply chains as quickly as possible, working together um, as supply chain partners, whether that is creating co-located hubs, whether that's integrating different partners throughout the battery supply chain in the UK. Um, and also the big magnifying glass now, of course, with the rising gas prices is focusing how quickly can we now transition to renewables? So we are relying on other countries for energy. I think it, we're, we're currently relying on uh, Russia for 4% of our gas. Quasi Quartain uh, quoted that we're looking to uh, stop all supplies of Russian gas coming in by the end of the year now. So we're going to have to make that deficit. Um, and I think, you know, we've got a tremendous opportunity um, to be able to up um, the amount of renewables that we're using, uh, just as business leaders and businesses throughout the country, whether it's with the battery supply chain or not, should be doing. It's certainly something that uh, here at Green Lithium, we are focusing on wherever we can use renewable energy, we will. The, the problem is, is finding enough renewable energy for us to use. And I think that's going to be the next bottleneck is actually the amount of green energy that's available to the UK and how quickly we can get that online. Uh, I know the government's looking at potential nuclear options as uh, well as the obviously very uh, growing other wind sectors, solar sectors, and uh, ever increasingly tidal within the UK that we can, uh, we can look at. Um, I think we all in the UK, uh, all businesses have an obligation now to, on, on the decarbonisation side, certainly, and this is moving on a bit from the Ukraine, but to be transparent and own their carbon impact, not only their carbon impact, but their impact in general, um, of which they should do this through uh, life cycle assessments. And through that, they should ultimately be aiming to get uh, scope one and two uh, carbon reduction immediately, and then work with the supply chain to focus on scope three. Um, and I see that as something that we can do here in the UK. We're incredibly good at innovation using technology. Um, and I think we should steer away from offsetting where we can and focus on the actual problem at hand and actually innovate carbon out of our supply chains within the battery supply chain in the UK. Excellent. Touched on some really great points there. And I think we'll come back to visit a number of those. 
um, just want to bring in each panelist in turn as, um, as well. And perhaps we don't have to talk specifically about Ukraine now. That's the context there, but this impact on supply chains. Uh, Jackie, do you want to um, bring in your your views here? Well, I'm going to leave Julian to talk about supply chain. He needs to do some work today. Yeah. Um, but actually, I think what I'll talk about is innovation, right? So um, we've been through a pandemic. We've got some major world events going on. And actually what that does um, is, is initially, I think it brings people down, but actually after a while we start to innovate. Um, and I think people start to really um, look at what their priorities are for the future. Um, and certainly in the people we speak to, there's a real drive to do the right thing more in the future that we need to transition. So you are seeing energy strategies change. You are seeing uh, rhetoric um, uh, around going forward positively. Um, but we have to count to that with, obviously, oil prices are significantly high at the moment. It does give this blip, hopefully in the short term, right? Hopefully the people of Ukraine, you know, obviously won't be focused on this and we should be focused on supporting them. But actually, as we go forward, people do start to go, you know, this is what's important, not just for me, not just for my future, but for that of, of future generations. And I think that's where uh, we're coming to is this uh, deep determination that the world needs to become a better place uh, on all levels. Um, and I know that, you know, in those crises, uh, we see innovation, we see development, we see people actually really putting the intellectual capacity to work. Um, and just personally, you know, there's something about making and building things uh, when you're feeling a little bit helpless or hopeless or, um, you know, upset that will make you uh, feel more positive. And I think actually even in a nation uh, or, or uh, as a continent, we'll see sort of shifts like that. Um, certainly. Excellent. Um, Julian, let's lead on to you then to give you some work today around supply chains from your perspective and also maybe for our viewers, just because we are primarily mining investment insights channel. Um, if you can tell us about um, the um, automation uh, fund and the advanced propulsion center as well. Yeah, just for everyone's orientation, um, the advanced propulsion center is uh, a not-for-profit organization. We were established in 2013. Uh, as a result of, uh, if you like, a joint venture between the Automotive Council in the UK and government, uh, what was then BIS and is now Bayes, um, to support with R&D grants in the mid to late stage technology development area to decarbonize uh, propulsion systems. We set out with a 10-year mission, uh, and more recently, we were appointed as government's delivery partner for the Automotive Transformation Fund, which is a capital fund designed to support industrialization at scale of uh, low carbon vehicle propulsion technologies supply chain. So not the vehicle OEMs, but actually upstream, things like batteries, motors, fuel cells, uh, and power electronics. So that, that's, that's our mission. So we've, we've been investing quite a bit of time and effort in looking at upstream supply chains. And actually, what do the future strategic supply chains look like for the electrified vehicle industry? You know, in those four key areas, uh, you know, around propulsion technologies. Um, and actually, um, you very quickly come to the conclusion um, that uh, this is actually a materials play, right? This isn't about an automotive assembly supply chain. This is a materials play with some intermediate processing. Um, so it, the UK's position has been to support the strategic parts of that supply chain right the way through where it's appropriate um, it, it, to, to first stage processing, if we have a competitive entitlement in the UK with a little bit of assistance to make it work. Now that's a really important caveat, right? I'm, I'm a, a fantastic believer in doing the right thing in the right place um, and, uh, and, and, and pushing on the right things. You know, we, we can all say that we're going to be the world's experts and the world's greatest producer of X, but frankly, if we don't have competitive entitlement, you can incentivize it as much as you like with grants up front, but it won't stay in the long term. So we have to look at what is right for the UK and what is needed by the UK. So we, we've identified a number of key areas of the supply chain that are necessary. And I'm going to start with a relatively straightforward one, which is really pertinent to this, to, to this discussion today, and that's around the upstream battery supply chain. Batteries are very expensive. 
they are going to be a much greater percentage of the downstream value of a finished vehicle than ever were fuel tanks or engines, uh, perhaps as much as 50% of the value of a finished car. They are crucial in terms of sourcing them locally from a, an inbound logistics perspective. They're expensive and difficult things to ship. Uh, and they also help you qualify for rule of origin to take advantage of free trade agreements. For example, the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the European Union. You have to have originating batteries by 2027. Otherwise, you can't play tariff free. When you look at what qualifies uh, a battery as originating, um, actually, you need active cathode material. It's also a very high percentage of the input value into making a cell. Around 80% of the value of a cell is its input materials. Of those input materials, about half is active cathode. Of the active cathode, a significant proportion is nickel and is lithium uh, and cobalt. Right? With those three, the holy trinity, you know, actually uh, you've got quite a lot of the value of a battery captured in those upstream materials. Does the UK have huge resources of all of those uh, of all of those minerals? Well, no, it's got some lithium, and we're trying to work on projects to, to do that. For example, uh, you know, exploit the, the, the granite-bound uh, brines in uh, in the southwest in Cornwall, where we've got some quite rich deposits, and that can really help. But when you're looking to make these big investments to support these huge, huge gigafactory investments, which might be two or three billion pounds. You know, with very long life cycles, you need to be sure that that investment can satisfy a few things. One, you've got downstream demand, right? And that, because of the nature of, of the output, tends to be quite local. You can't ship these things economically all the way around the world. You need to be able to access funding. And there are some participants on the call who can help in that respect, for example. Um, you need to be sure that you can deliver uh, to your timing schedule. You need to be sure that the policy environment supports permitting, for example, and that you can actually find land in sufficient quantum. But the other crucial thing that many people forget is you need to be able to access a secure, resilient upstream supply chain of those inbound materials because it is such a big part. So that's why there's such a big focus. And if you look at what's happening in the, the market with these materials, you know, we've seen this with, with I'm going to take lithium as an example. 2015, only about a third of global lithium use perhaps was in uh, lithium mine batteries. The rest was pharmaceuticals, desiccants and various other uses. By 2020, that had completely inverted. More than two thirds of it was associated with lithium mine batteries. We're seeing the same thing happen with nickel, switching out of predominant use in stainless steels and plating industries and moving towards lithium mine batteries, particularly the later chemistries with very nickel rich concentrations. So what happens when you've got these big assets that are producing batteries tied to even bigger assets producing cars, which have got very, very high intrinsic values, you need to keep that machine fed. So you have to find secure supply chains for your nickel and for your lithium and for your cobalt where it's required. And, and frankly, we're in this absolute classic, just as Brian was articulating at the start, you know, we've got this... Um, this really difficult tipping point now with some of these upstream materials where we're seeing a supply and demand imbalance, you know, to the point where nickel trading has been suspended, right? Um, it, it's, it's just very, very difficult when you need to have longer lead times to bring on board each of the upstream elements. It might take three years to build a battery factory. It might take four and a half or five years to build a nickel refinery. It might take 10 years to bring on board a new mining operation. So if you don't have some foresight in that process to what the downstream demand is for something that is going to be a major user of these materials, then we're going to get a, a crush point, a pinch point at some point in the development. So we have to, we have to deploy some foresight. Are we there now? Is that crunch point here, given what's going on? I think we've, we've got a very short term issue associated with um, worries about sanctions, given that you know, we've got a very, very large global producer of nickel you know, that sits in Russia with uh, mm. not as nickel, nickel. PGMs to mention as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so so that, that's, um, 
that's something that's very, very short term, and we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, but when you look at it, uh, you know, in the longer term, I do anticipate that we will see some significant pressures in bringing on stream refining capability and bring on board new reserves um, that also meet the other things that need to be supported as part of this transition. Let's, let's, let's just reflect back. We're moving to EVs um, to try and help a global warming problem, a climate change problem. Okay. The last thing that we want to do is to fix a climate change problem and walk into another problem along ESG grounds where we are extracting minerals in a non-sustainable way, in a non-ethical way. So we have to make sure that we don't jump out of the frying pan into the fire. Yep. Certainly. I'd like to take that uh, chance to bring Kate um, to introduce you as well um, to our audience because it's the first time we've had an interaction with um, you and Longwall uh, Ventures and also on Julian's final point there sort of around ESG um, uh, making sure that we don't um, come out the frying pan and into the fire um, but with that thinking about some of the um, circular economy um, um, downstream elements that I believe you're looking more closely at rather than sort of primary material supply um, and if you could just introduce um, long wall as well because it's very interesting for us to have vc capital uh, perspective here because usually we're speaking with sort of large hedge funds private equity um, specialist mind finance for instance so yeah please thanks adam and and thank you very much for inviting me to take part today um it's a it's it's really interesting for me to get the perspectives of the other panelists on this actually as well mm. so we're a very early stage um venture capital tech investor we invest in startup companies, usually pre-revenue, uh, in science, engineering, healthcare, so deep tech space. And we have a number of investments in clean tech, although we're not a clean tech specialist. So um, I'm quite interested in the, the disruptive um, opportunities that, that the crises um, uh, lead, lead towards. And it's obviously not, I mean, nobody, nobody wishes that this is what it takes for us to change. But we've seen with COVID that actually one of the big changes, I mean, Jackie's, Jackie and Richard talked a lot about the innovation that comes from this and people taking the opportunity to, to rip up the rules and look at a really different approach in these sectors. Um, and I think, you know, there's already from, a, from the research base, we see lots of uh, people looking at the materials challenges and saying, well, if we couldn't use lithium, what are the alternatives? There's a huge amount of work, as Julian has alluded to, to scale that into something that actually works on uh, on a scale that's going to solve any of the problems. But but you can certainly see the 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 green shoots there. And I think for me, one of the possibly more interesting things that you see is around that consumer behaviour and how people become much more aware of how how interconnected all these supply chains are, and um, they start to think about well do I want my pension pot being invested in this way? And actually, I think that has the potential to pull through some of those really interesting innovations um, uh, to, to give some momentum to them and also to provide different sources to finance. Because one of the things that's very clear to all of us is that you know, we need to have better connectivity throughout the supply chain in order to uh, affect change at the scale that we're all talking about here. So that's certainly where my interests lie in this. And I do think your point about circular economy becomes, starts to become more interesting. The, 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 the assumptions around cost base perhaps are one of the things that will, that will change. Um, and, and there's a lot of opportunity in that for people to approach it differently. Um, thank you. Um, so I want to dive into some of those topics in more detail later on. Um, but I figured it would be nice to move on to some of the challenges that UK specific around developing a hub that's necessary to thrive, um, creating the gigafactories and the capacity that we need um, and um, finding the scale that works. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to jump into um, UK sort of updates on gigafactories and the progress there. Um, there was an interesting piece from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence recently around sort of two gigawatt hour current capacity and where it needs to get to by a 2030 target of 175 gigawatt hours. There's a long way to go. Um, but what are we doing good at the moment? What, what can you tell the audience that you know we're, we're moving in the right direction? Well, 
But perhaps I might I might dive in at this point because this, please, this kind of, is kind of your my day job. Indeed, <laughs> um, British vote, please. Uh, amongst others, yeah. I mean, um, I mean, the APC. We've done some work, some work to uh, engage directly with the vehicle producing OEMs in the UK uh, and understand what their demand profile looks like through to twenty thirty, for example, uh, based on their cycle plans. And actually. Um, for vehicle for vehicles that they want to build in the UK, we probably need just for passenger car and light commercial around 95 gigawatt hour of lithium ion battery production in the UK by 2030. Um, today we're producing about two gigawatt hours, uh, mainly to support Nissan's operation at Sunderland um, out of Envision ASC up, uh, in the plant next door. If you add in all of the other uses for lithium ion batteries, such as static energy storage, uh, aero, rail, marine, etc., then you end up with a much bigger number, which is the one that you referred to from BMI. Um, where are we in that journey? Um, well, we've got around two gigawatt hours currently in production. We've actually secured a further nine gigawatt hours commitment to investment, and that's in detailed planning stage now. In fact, the planning commission has been granted for Envision's second stage facility, and we fully expect that to grow over time. And we've also secured upwards of 30 gigawatt hour through, uh, uh, through British Vault's uh, investment. Um, so against that kind of 95, 96 gigawatt hour uh, requirement by 2030, just for vehicles, just for passenger car and light commercial, we're about 30 or 40% of the way there. And we've got some other prospects that are in play. Um, but we're never going to get to a perfect balance because the UK's need for batteries is quite diverse. Not every battery is the same, not every requirement is the same. Mm. Um, and frankly, to make batteries economically, you need to get to a certain economic scale. So we are inevitably going to see some batteries in modest, modest volumes suiting specialist needs being imported into the UK and actually vice versa, exported from the UK. Um, you know, we have got some really specialist producers. We've got a heavy duty sector, a very big mining equipment sector, actually, um, perhaps with requirement for specialist cells that can charge and discharge very quickly. You know, and they've got very different requirements um, from your average city car or at the other end of the scale, we've got hypercars and supercars that also need very high performing batteries, but in a different sense. So we're going to see this balance. Um, where do I think we will get to through the funds that we've got available um, through the policy instrument of the Auto to Transformation Fund? I think, um, I think with what we've got on the books at the moment, I think we can get very close to 80 or 90 gigawatt hours of invested capacity commitment within the next 12 or 18 months. Uh, to be built out in that period between now and 2030. Uh, and our focus is also on what do we need in the upstream supply chain? What do we need in the intermediate producer space? The sorts of operations, for example, you know, that Richard you know, and, uh, and, and Brian uh, are also working in um, you know, to, to deal with uh, production scrap, to deal with end of life batteries, to deal with some of those uh, intermediate um, uh, chemicals. And because this is largely, a, you know, as, I, as I said, a materials based drive. Yep. Certainly. Coming back to that, then, um, Brian or Richard, do you want to opine on you know, UK and, and, and lithium specifically, whether it's mid tier processing or, or indeed finding new sources um, in town in Cornwall? No. no, if I could comment, I think the UK has some clear advantages to be a significant player in the energy transition and the EV revolution in terms of innovation and technology um, and sources of financing and commitment of government. Um, where the UK, but all of this does, as we've been discussing, depend on security supply of inputs. And what we're doing, and we are, um, I think, probably the biggest investor in, in through Cornish Lithium, which is a company we're supporting to the creation of lithium chemical production from both hard rock and brine-based resources, in Cornwall, um, the, my fear is that what we're doing as industry is far too little, far too late. And we really need to radically accelerate the transformation of our industry globally and, and specifically to the UK in the UK context in terms of scale. And as you mentioned, in terms of ESG standards and carbon footprint in order to be a, 
um, responsible contributor to a successful EV transition and energy transition more broadly. Um, and I'm not clear, I mean, these gigawatts of capacity that you talk about being developed, they're being developed by parties who are obviously, you know, with your help and assistance, starting to get their head around the supply pipeline, but they've got a hell of a long way to go. I mean, you've got, you know, to, to look outside the UK, you know, in order not to cast any stones too close to, to home. But I mean, North Vault in Sweden and, and with their developments in Europe, they have a lot of money now. They've got momentum. They've got, they're in the right place at the right time and they will succeed because the support and the, participation they're receiving financially and from the industry. They claim they're going to have 50% of their inputs from their own recycling in five years' time, which is just, in, in my view, ridiculous. They don't have the feed. They don't have the technology. So, I mean, recycling is very important. We're very engaged in recycling through life cycle in the U.S. and Momentum in Texas. But we, you know, at, at the very best case scenario in 10 years time, if the recycling ecosystem develops optimally, maybe it'll provide 20, 25% of the battery metal inputs into new lithium ion battery manufacturing ecosystem. Um, you know, so the players are nowhere, the auto industry is nowhere. You know, the VWs of this world, the, you know, the Jaguar Land Rovers of this world, they're starting to understand they've got a problem and the, that appreciation of the challenge that they realize they've got is, starting to, to, to move in the direction of panic, but what to do about it and how to engage and take the type of equity risk they're going to have to take both domestically and globally in mining and metal processing in order to ensure preferential access to product in order to exist in five or 10 years time, let alone succeed, is, is coming much, much later than it should. I mean, we as an industry needed to, and I'm talking globally, deploy $100 billion three years ago in order to avoid the industry cliff that we're now inevitably heading to over the next five years. If you look at the UK context, the UK has some advantages in the supply chain. It's not particularly well endowed with minerals, though obviously the Cornwall can, and I believe will be a very significant contributor to the supply chain going into lithium ion battery manufacturing. It doesn't have nickel or cobalt or any rare earths um, in quantities that will be meaningful but the UK does have sources of capital it does have a very developed and internationally networked mining and metals industry and it has to support that industry and and mobilize that industry in order to feed a domestic UK EV system and supply chain and that's something that I know a lot of people on this call are working on and doing a lot of making a lot of progress on with respect to the analysis and the thinking but, but there are two things that are missing. I mean, government sort of knows this is a priority area and are fiddling around with the edges. And I know a lot of great things have been done by Faraday Institute and others, but you know, we need a lot, lot more. I mean, this is a crisis and a source of enormous national, you know, industrial competitiveness, labor, employment, um, global, you know, economic success imperative. Um, and it's 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 not being prioritized to the extent it is in terms of government funding support for the transformation of this industry to ensure the UK is part of success in the energy transition and the EV industry globally. Um, and sources of capital, you know, the UK is a major financial center. They're big funds um, and they're increasingly pools of ESG, climate change, impact investing, financing, who are not looking at mining or metals because the assumption is that it's sort of uncomfortable. We want an energy transition, but we're more comfortable punting on the latest, you know, autonomous drivers driving software startup that is radically overvalued, but it sounds sexy than actually investing in the capacity to feed the manufacturing of the systems that are going to successfully create a sustainable, um, low carbon future that, you know, we all want for our kids and grandkids. And that has to change. They have to realize that mining can be low impact environmentally and responsible ecologically. It can be constructive in terms of its governance, in terms of its social and political engagement, and it has to be. And it has to be supported to be so. So the big institutions should be looking at how the hell can we deploy 10, 20, $50 billion in metal, you know, and mining and processing in order to feed 
this transformation of a very significant part of UK industry um, in a way that's responsible and sustainable, as opposed to ignoring it. The fact that COP26 didn't have mining and metals on the agenda or in significant, significant extent in, in attendance is just utterly ridiculous. So, you know, we, we, they, you know, we all collectively need to do much, much more to educate institutions, to educate and organize accelerated programs and action on the part of government institutions. If the UK is going to have any auto industry or any, you know, in any way successful or optimized transition to renewable energy sources in the national grid, you know, over the next five, 10 years. Mm. So I don't want to sound alarmist, but we've got a major crisis that, you know, we're all fiddling around on the edges of. Mm. Yeah, certainly. Excellent. Can I come in on that that then? Please do. So um, the challenge here is this is an absolutely massive market failure from an automotive perspective, from a vehicle perspective, from a supply chain um, perspective. And the question has been really, and I think over the last four and a half years, is understanding that we see knowledge gaps and uh, difficulties in sort of knowing how this is all going to work or even, Brian, I guess, how it could work. So we see, you know, companies like Tesla and VW buying mines. I doubt if they'd done that, Brian, a few years ago. Um, And you see people like Glencore buying into British Vault and and trying. And I I think genuinely that's around people really trying to work out how this is going to work right um and you know as much as unfortunately you know as somebody who works for government um uh I, I i'm not the intellect that brian is i do find it quite difficult to write a business case with public money that shows a return on investment uh uh for taxpayers um for mining for example you've got you get to a point where you don't know very quickly. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't. That that's uh, and you can see, you know, the automated transformation fund really coming into its own, particularly there. And we're learning, right? Um, and I really take the um, maybe I'll take the suggestion from Brian that we need to hurry hurry ourselves along a little bit, uh, maybe start sprinting. But um, you know, the appetite really is in this space to understand, to learn, make interventions where they're going to work and pay back to tax players, where we can collaborate, where we can work with inst- financial institutions, private sector, and Kate can, can comment as well, so we can help people understand. I mean, what you described to me, Brian, is a massive risk. It sounds terrifying, but actually, if I'm an investor, that might be the space I want to mine and find out more about and, and, and look at investing in uh, by working with Julian, the Farida Battery Challenge, um, and others to really understand what that could look like as an investor. Because the flip of the coin is, whilst um, we're seeing oil prices having a massive excel- you know, price hike at the moment, you know, if I'm exposed on coal, for example, as a mining company, I might be thinking quite long and hard about my next five to 10 year strategy and what business cases I might make there and who I might be working with in terms of sort of syndicating some loans up so I can do something that's pretty um, transformational, that's perhaps a bit more ambitious than I would have been 10 years ago, because actually right here, right now, um, my future is becoming a bit clearer in that it isn't going to be the status quo and I'm not going to get away with incremental change. I'm going to have to do something that is incisive and dramatic in this market failure that we're experiencing. Can I uh, jump in there? Please, Richard, yeah. Thank you, Jackie, and uh, thank you, Brian. I mean, you both, uh, and and Julian, Kate, you know, it's uh, music to my ears, you know, it's we've got such good opinions coming across here, and we are in the middle of a climate crisis. That's it. So Brian, you know, sounds passionate about it. We we are. So, you know, where he says um, that COP mining wasn't spoken about. I was at COP uh, representing Green Lithium, and nobody was talking about it. And I'd stand up and say, there's an elephant in the room here. You're not talking about the supply of raw materials that are going to fuel this green energy transition. And uh, to them, it was all focused on what are the barriers uh, and the bottlenecks to entry for EV sales? And I said, well, it's not charging infrastructure, it's availability of raw materials to build the electric vehicles for decarbonisation. So really good observations. So I think, you know, what we're all agreeing on, uh, and certainly what we're trying to do here, Green Lithium, is enable the transition to sustainable energy, creating a fairer 
socially um, sustainable net zero carbon economy. Um, and I think in the UK, we, we really have a good shot of doing that. Uh, not, not enough has been done, definitely, um, but everyone is paddling really hard in, in that. Um, we've certainly got uh, support off the Automated Transformation Fund uh, 12 months ago. That was absolutely fantastic for what Green Lithium are doing in bringing the UK's first lithium refinery uh, to, to the battery supply chain to be able to support that supply chain in the UK. Um, we think that there is an appetite now for partnerships throughout the supply chain. Um, as Jackie said, you know, British Vault partnering with Glencore and the likes of that. People are starting to realise that, you know, we, we can be better together um, and start to look at where we can co-locate and where the benefits of that through, whether it's the use of renewable energy, whether it's the use of uh, knowledge and skills. Um, but all in all, I think that the, the thing is, and going back to what Julian said and Brian, if we haven't got those resources, and let's take lithium uh, as the example, in the quantities um, needed in the time that we need it, then we're going to need to get it from uh, other places. But the next step in that is the refining step, and that's where that's where we come in, and we say, well, we're going to produce the lithium hydroxide or the lithium carbonate that can support a uh, low carbon battery supply chain within the UK. What we want to try and encourage now is the other members of that supply chain to come together. We want to encourage an active cathode manufacturer to set up shop within the UK. So as Julian said, uh, we can create that active cathode material value within the UK using UK refined lithium hydroxide or lithium carbonate. You know, hopefully some of it coming from Cornwall, um, you know, and all working together to be able to establish a a really stable supply chain um, and you know we, we think that's the way forward and we have been working on this you know for sort of four years ten months now so uh, we, we believe in it just like everyone on, on this call so I think there is a chance I think people do need to wake up uh, financial institutions and, and actually realize the green energy transition is the best opportunity financially that they're probably ever going to be given I always describe to people uh, what we're doing as um, we're building a boat on the sand. And when the tide comes in and it floats, people are going to call us clever. And uh, I think it's an idea that ultimately there's only one way to go, and that's transitioning to green energy. And if we're inputting the correct um, ESG uh, focused infrastructure in place um, and doing it together, then we stand a pretty good chance of our boats floating and us as a, as a supply chain within the UK actually making a difference and showing the rest of the world how it can actually be done. Yeah, and if I could, I, I think that's absolutely right. And the UK and the world needs green lithium to be a five or $10 billion business um, in 10 years time. It's essential to diversify away from the reliance on China for processing and to have that element of the supply chain, domestic, you know, local and, and well-governed and efficient. And it's tough, you know, as you know, it's a very tough challenge and to compete with um, lower environmental standards and lower cost of capital and a lot of scale and government support in China is very, very difficult to do. But it doesn't, it's essential, but it still requires on feed of primary resource on a scale way beyond anything that has been produced in these metals historically. And that's really, again, I, I, I'm coming back to the scale of the problem and hence meaningful efforts to find solutions for UK industry. Um, you know, we're spending a few hundred millions of dollars in Brazil developing nickel cobalt production. We're spending a few tens of millions, which will hopefully evolve into a few hundreds of millions in Cornwall developing a, a, a localized supply chain for lithium chemicals. And that's great, but it's, it's scratching the surface. We need 10, 20, 50 times that. And yet we've got UK mining champions like Rio Tinto, who are making massive profits mining iron ore in the Pilbara. And this year, I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but they paid 16, $17 billion dividend. That's criminal. 
They should be deploying that $16 billion in making the contribution they have the opportunity to make to the metals going into the energy transition for the sake of their shareholders, because they can create a lot of value out of this, because the, the price of these metals will continue to appreciate faster than other commodities um, in order to incentivize supply to meet this exponential growth in demand. So the markets will correct over time, but albeit inefficiency and efficiently with radical lags that we are talking about the, the, the implications of. Um, and they will be doing for the betterment of the country where they are listed and domiciled, which needs to transition in terms of renewable energy in the EV industry and needs to be fed with security of supply that they can be a big part of. They have the expertise, they have the global reach, they know how to mine and process metals, and they're not doing it. They're kind of messing around in Serbia with a lithium projects that they've wasted money on have now been kicked out of. They're buying a, a B division lithium project in Argentina to, so that they can sort of pretend they're in lithium. Yeah, I'm, I'm exaggerating and I'm being insulting and I apologize to Rio Tinto, which is a wonderful country, company. But, but I think, you know, you know, the government should be incentivizing Rio Tinto to deploy some of the $16 billion in the building capacity in the supply chain for the metals that the world needs to decarbonize and the UK needs in order to have an auto industry and a renewable industry, you know, energy industry in five years and 10 years time. And, and this is the goes the same, same for the large institutions. And government can play a very important role in this because you know, these institutions are, are driven by shareholder value. And unfortunately, in many instances, short-term shareholder value. Um, and government can balance that by using tax, using regulations. Um, and that's something we have to focus on because, you know, we're doing really well. You know, take Met, we're in the right place at the right time. We're creating fantastic shareholder value. We've got lovely projects around Africa and North America and South America. But the world needs 500 take Mets yesterday and 500 green lithiums yesterday. And, you know, so, you know, looking at the bigger picture of what the UK industry needs, and it's part of the world, you know, we really have to think big and aggressively and urgently beyond our own interests and our own shareholders. Certainly. Yeah, there's a lot of um, key points touched on there um, inherent to the challenge. I want to move away from the materials input element just briefly so we can touch on the circular economy themes that we've been mentioned sequentially throughout. Kate, you mentioned something really interesting at the start around the cost-based assumptions around um, recycling, for instance. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit on that? And maybe some of the areas where you're looking either for investments or what you're seeing um, that uh, are changing sort of for the positive in this circular economy thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the challenges in this, and, and it's sort of come across in the in the comments from um, the other speakers as well, is how do you get the industry to act as a whole? Because the, the fragmentation of the supply chain is one of the big challenges I think that we face mm-hmm. and, and getting everyone to act in concert is, is essential. And, and, and again, I think that's another role that government can play. Brian's talked a lot about the levers that they have in terms of regulation, but there's also a convening power there that I think is really important. Um, one of the challenges in any materials business is always how much what scale do you need to have for this to be to, to give a return on investment for a financial investor? Um, because actually a lot of the value tends to sit further down the supply chain closer to consumers. Um, and I think for me, that's one of the really interesting things when there's a lot of flux in commodity prices. Actually, the inherent costs in recycling and reconditioning and, and prepping um using what's already been extracted the economics around that can start to become more attractive in times of of crisis elsewhere in the supply chain um so there's some really interesting um technologies that we're starting to see come through i think one of the big challenges though is always um an assumption that because it's greener people will back it rather than understanding that for a lot of investors, um, the, the, the financial side still has to be there. Um, and, and that's a common mistake that we see, that people think that, well, because it's clean tech and it's a good thing to do, um, that they'll be able to finance it. And, and unfortunately, that's often 
um, it, you know, it still has to make sense that the business fundamentals still have to be in place. And I think that's where the, the, the change in commodity prices offer some real opportunities there. Yeah, if I might uh, just dive in there just to pick Please. a couple of points. I think, you know, the points that Brian uh, uh, and Kate have made are really, really important in that what we're looking at here is a different scale, different time duration for investments. And we're also dealing with a technology sector where that technology is advancing very rapidly. Um, you know, when you're making you know, these long term extractive industry investment decisions, they're not a three, four, five year uh, horizon decision you're investing for the long term right now if you if you are seeing a significant shift in the downstream demand for those materials and whether it's extractive or whether it's intermediate processing to particular specifications you want to be sure that you're not going to end up with a stranded asset because somebody's actually found a newer and better technology with this rapidly advancing technology cycle um, and, that, and that's really problematic because we've seen dare I say, a little bit of schizophrenia in the industry about, you know, is, is it going to be all EV or is it going to be hydrogen fuel cells and we're going to use hydrogen as a fuel vector? And actually, we just need to dial back a little bit and think, look, actually, lithium-ion batteries, they're going to be with us for quite a long time. Yeah, technology into solid state still needs lithium, still needs similar active cathode materials, right? the downstream demand is gonna be quite stable and we're going to need more of it. And then we will get a bit closer to this circular economy. And Brian, I do, I do agree with you, by the way, about the recycling percentages that you cited earlier. I think that's, that's quite a realistic expectation. And we are seeing regulation drivers towards that as well with updates to the batteries directive requiring a degree of recycling. And that has a double benefit, by the way, because it also means that the stuff that gets to end of life has got an inherent value. And instead of the car makers having to have a contingent liability for every battery electric vehicle they make today, historically, yeah, actually they can switch the accounting treatment to call it an asset uh, because there is an inherent value in that thing at the end of its life when you can recover. And, we, and we're working you know, with a number of projects on how to improve the efficacy and the efficiency uh, of materials recovery from batteries and designing for recovery of materials at a later stage by virtue of battery design and the chemistries. But we've got to convey the message. And, and this is where, you know, I think we have had success in being able to anchor the kind of the top of the food chain investors in battery manufacturing, because there is a very clear and crystallized uh, forecast as to what the demand is going to look like. I'm not sure that's worked its way all the way upstream through the intermediates and into the downstream extractive industries. And the more that we can promulgate that there is some stability and some longevity in this downstream use, the more chance we stand of switching on those upstream investments. Just to uh, counteract that, the ESG question, is this holding capital back? Okay, it's accelerating in one respect. You know, we're moving away from hydrocarbons. We've seen divestment in oil majors from some of the largest pension funds globally, et cetera. There's clear corporate and board level effort, you know, shareholder activism taking place. But it, ESG is also stifling the volume of capital that can go into some of these upstream plays for raw materials. There's no question that is a massive problem. There's a perception on the part of providers of capital that the mining industry, by its fundamental nature, is um, negative from an environmental impact point of view and historically irresponsible from a social and political engagement and governance point of view. And there are reasons for that, and some of the reasons are good in terms of elements of the history of the industry, and some are bad and ignorant, but it certainly is something that does not need to be the case. And companies like ourselves and then many others are seeking to be at the forefront of the industry's transformation to ensure that the projects we invest in and build are, are responsible and low environmental impact and very cult socially and politically responsible and well-governed and constructive and low carbon footprint. And that's increasingly something that the Teslas and GMs and the BWs of this world uh, will require and therefore it will have a tangible value benefit to the companies who act correctly and develop correctly in terms of preferential access to market and ultimately pricing. So there, it's not just altruistic because we all want to do things nicely and be ethical. Um, 
but the providers of capital need to understand that and therefore get over their um, hesitancy in order to supply us as an industry with what we need in terms of investment to transform um, with respect to volumes and, and scale and standards. Um, so it's a massive limitation and I'm not sure what the answer is. The answer is, you know, education and engagement. And, and you know, as Kate says, the convening power of government can be enormously valuable in that um, because, you know, it's, it's urgent and immediate. Certainly. Okay, I was going to come on to another point. Um, I'll, I'll just make a mention to the viewers who are with us live. If they want to submit any questions, there is a Q&A tab, so go for it now while we've got five minutes left, and I'll, I'll announce those. Um, but I want to come on to the skills and knowledge question that's sort of been touched on across and um, across various responses, um, and it ties in with you know building the uh, capabilities domestically. UK has obviously been a hub for innovation we've seen across science um, and STEM skills um, pushed from, from education stage through, through businesses. Um, but a lot of this battery, battery advancement in, uh, requires very specific skills. If we think about lithium extraction, for instance, the skill set for that is very concentrated in certain sort of hubs around the world. Um, and it's arguably nascent in certain areas. Does the UK have sufficient skills and knowledge, certainly from a post-education, post-school level, um, to scale in the way that we've been talking about? Um, I, I can take that certainly from uh, yeah. a standpoint of green lithium and, and how we've looked to build our business model uh, to leverage uh, skill sets from international partners um, that have worked on some of these uh, projects in other areas of the world to initially leverage international uh, expertise from first-hand experience. But then ultimately, we want to be seeing uh, technical experience transitioning out of fossil fuel burning industries within the UK and processing, maybe uh, people that have worked in other similar industries. A lot of our team are actually ex-nuclear. So they've got experience of building large scale uh, energy infrastructure projects within the UK, which is crucial to what we're doing in building the UK's first lithium refinery. So there are a lot of um, available transferable uh, areas. So we've got to be looking at how we can transfer from other industries that are really strong within the UK. You know, we've got a fantastic chemical sector. Um, and, and as we transition away from hydrocarbons, um, you know, more of that sector can go into the likes of um, mineral refining, um, also looking at the battery side of things as well, um, but also looking to, to partner as well. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of uh, bringing the skills in initially from areas that have done it, done it well, because that gets us up to speed quickly, because we can't wait around with this. And then the third point would be, you know, we need to be investing now in the training centres within the schools and the colleges within the UK, creating the technology hubs, um, and encouraging um, our younger generations to make that move into uh, careers that are really going to make a difference within the green economy and the UK and help us build that. Um, so investing in, in definitely sort of um, in, in the college uh, state at the moment. So that's the sort of three things I'd look to, uh, to comment on that. Certainly. Excellent. Um, Jackie, do you have any insights on, on, on that? I know you're, uh, you know, a lecturer, director, fully embedded in the education system as well. <laughs> so I guess, um, so my background's engineering um, and actually extraction metallurgy engineering. So I would suggest there are, as Richard said, lots of directly transferable, but we also have, you know, paper mills in the UK that can look at actually how you roll a, a cell, process cells. There's a lot of transferable skills and we do see that. What we do need is that central piece, right? And the Faraday Battery Challenge and APC uh, and partners like that, we work together, right? So you, you can go and have a look at the Warwick Manufacturing Group's uh, national framework for skills so that we actually really are trying to bring together a map of how the UK can transition skills that it has to this new uh, technologies. Um, and let's, you know, and, and for Faraday going forward, that's going to be a focus of ours. 
um, to make sure that actually there's funding for that and also uh, that there's some practical help on the ground, uh, as, as you say, for T levels, for example, all the way through to Farad Institution PhDs. Yep, excellent. Well, look, we've got about one minute left. I just wanted to round off with a bit of a trivial question, but it's interesting nonetheless. Who here on the panel is driving an electric vehicle at the moment? Is everyone driving an EV? <laughs> Can I, can I have my electric bike? Does that count? <laughs> yes, e-bike, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yeah. that's, what was, that's what I was putting my hand up for, my e-bike. So yeah. yeah, indeed. There's lots of those around. Very good. Okay, well, it's great to see we're all uh, advocates of yeah, um, all we're supporting and what we're working in. Um, very good. Well, listen, um, Richard, Jackie, Kate, uh, Brian, Julian, thanks so much for your time. It's been really um, insightful and look forward to getting the replay for this out to the market. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.